Hello everybody, this video is intended to go over contracts, which is the starting point for any use of the system of synchro cost. This contract is the core to um, many of the elements that you see to the right of contracts, schedule device, change, change orders, change orders, and payment applications. Uh, and without having a contract established and permission and access to that contract to at least view, uh, you will not be able to use the other functions of the application. So make sure that uh, when we generate these contracts that we understand the impact of having versus not having access to a particular contract. In this example, I have uh, a contract listed here. Um, we'll, we'll dive into that in just one second, but let's first take a look at what it would look like to create a new contract. If I hit this create contract button at the top, which is granted through the permission section, which we talked about in another video, um, you can see that there is a host of uh, fillable uh, fields that we need to uh, fill in data for in order to save this thing uh, and get it to a point where we can start using it. Um, the contract name, pretty clearly you want to identify and name this so that you can identify what, you're, what work you're, you're doing on a particular contract. Um, you can break this into disciplines or you can call it prime versus sub, et cetera. Um, currency code, this is in you know US dollars, euro and Australian dollars. The amount will be the, the, the total currency amount. And then there's start date and end date. I think these are pretty obvious. You're saying when your contract starts and then when your contract ends. Uh, percent, uh, PCO retainage and retainage percentage. These values do not have math associated with them at this time uh, further down the road. So if you're not familiar with retainage, the intent is that uh, a contractor would typically have um, a, an amount or a percentage held by the owner uh, before the work uh, is completed to ensure that the contractor doesn't leave the job early, uh, et cetera. So the uh, idea here is that there could be two different retainages, one for potential change orders, uh, which are for work that is not of the original contract. So that may, may carry a separate different percentage than the actual contract retainage percentage. Um, so again, neither of these values do any math in the system at this point in time. The intent here is to capture highlighted information so that it's easy to find in case you wanted to look it up. Um, we'll cover this more when we get to payment applications. Duration unit, um, this is calendar days, working days, man hours, if you're doing, um, uh, you know, uh, industrial type work, you know, plant, etc. cetera. Uh, calendar days will probably be the most widely used because everybody's familiar with the same calendar. Work days is a little more complicated, but we, again, here we don't have any math functions or ability to dictate what a working day is. Uh, we would need to include things like, you know, regional holidays and things like that or a way to ha handle that. So we don't have that. So we're basically just building out for the future to make sure we have some way of accounting for it. Um, the original duration, this is where you just type in the number of days, and this is most likely going to be uh, the days from the start date to the end date. Um, contractor organization, this is the organization that is acting as a contractor on the contract. The contractee organization is who is essentially paying uh, their contractor to do the work. In many instances, this may be an owner or a city or, you know, something like that, a, a, a public municipality uh, paying a particular contractor to do work. I mean, it doesn't have to be that way, but it's possible. And the intent or the idea here is that we wrote contractor and contractee because the contractor could be a subcontractor and the contractee could be the prime contractor. That's another way of looking at this. So this is a flexible system. Uh, we wanna make sure that anybody who jumps in, no matter where who you are on the contract, we have a place for you. Uh, purchase order number, just um, an, a, a data entry point that, that some uh, organizations like to have. It doesn't need to be populated. The discipline set, in North America, we have standard, standardized discipline sets using the Construction Standards Institute, which is also known as CSI. Uh, and so we have the CSI 16 division, CSI 50 division, and not applicable. So 
the not applicable would probably take place or be used for you know non North American uh, entities or companies that don't care about this stuff. Uh, it's it's totally possible to use the system and not have an organized breakdown uh, by in, quote unquote divisions, and that's again how we do stuff in North America. But um, if you did choose uh, not applicable, then you kind of don't have to worry about this stuff. One other thought is in the future. Um, we do hope to be able to include additional uh, predetermined discipline sets for uh, different regions of the world or different places. Um, so we have the ability to do that, but that would be a future feature. Uh, you can also choose uh, a parent contract. I already have a uh, draft prime contract as listed here. Uh, I, I wrote prime in the name, the contract name, so it was clear and identifiable. So if we were building a subcontract, this uh, subcontract could be um, to the prime. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to create the relationship. There's actually no uh, connection beyond calling it a prime versus a sub at this point in time, meaning if you make a change on a subcontractor level, then that change will all automatically be pushed to the prime contractor level. We did not build that functionality because the uh, prime contractor uh, may want to add his own markups to uh, a, a, a change order or something uh, associated with the owner. So they want their own cut. Maybe they'll add on, you know, 10% to what the subcontractor said they would do. And so you don't necessarily want that flow uh, or connection with the data points uh, when it comes to dollars. But we have the ability to at least say there is a prime and there is a parent to these other subs, whatever the case may be. You can have multiple subs to a singular parent, et cetera. Again, no data actually flows. Uh, we're looking for feedback to see if that's something we need to account for in the future. Um, down below that we have participants. Uh, here I can choose who I want to add to this contract. Unfortunately right now I'm the only person available here, but the idea stands the same. And am I a contractor or contractee? Which side of the contract am I on? This holds great value. Uh, the idea is that if you are on one side of the contract, you should not be able to see draft documents on the uh, other side of the contract. They could still be um, uh, hidden is not the right word, but shouldn't should not the data should not be available to you yet until uh, something is is assigned to you, so you can look at uh, what they were putting together. So, for example, if I was to create a um, potential change order with you know five line items and it's still in draft, we're still trying to figure out the math and how much we should we should ask for, and the pricing still not figured out. You know, I need to talk to my boss and make sure the numbers look right, square. Then. I want to make sure that it stays on my side of the contract until I assign it to someone on the other side of the contract. So this field is, holds great importance, right? You, wanna, you don't want to show your cards too early. Um, okay, so if I go to, um, that's, that's the difference here. And, and likewise, the contract is the same thing. They may want to create, you know, anybody can create a potential change order. It's, it's, it's a potential. It's not for sure. So. The, the owner could also be like, we're thinking about doing a design change or, you know, something along those lines. And we know there's going to be a cost occurred, but we think it's going to cost this much. Let's just give it to the contractor and see what he says. And the contractor may say, oh, yeah, you're right or whatever. So, but you don't want to show the other side. So I'm just saying this works both ways. It is a two-way street. Uh, going to permissions, if I click on this. I can see the different permissions I can grant and give to an individual user that has access to the contract. Here I'm looking at myself, uh, but obviously I'll be wanting to add other people, but I would need to do that through the other access screen. We talked about this in another video where you want to make sure that we give permissions to people that have access to cost. Well, the only way to get access to cost is to add them to a role that has the permission to get at cost access, etc. cetera. Um, so, there are essentially two layers when it comes to permissions. One being, do you have access to the module, the, the cost module tab, the cost module on the left? If you don't, then you won't even get to this screen. So this is the second layer of that. Uh, we handle permissions inside of cost in this manner where you can talk about this contract and we specifically call out this contract because there may be multiple contracts on the job. Uh, for this, you can either view it or publish it. If you can publish it, that means that you can essentially take uh, cost uh, down uh, from, you know, proceeding on a particular contract because there was changes to the contract or you need an emergency stop or who knows, whatever the case may be. Uh, below that schedule of values, 
and here you can uh, import or sorry, you can view a schedule device and then you can create schedule device. Uh, we'll talk about schedule device when we get to that next um, later. So potential change orders, uh, you can view, create, assign, approve. These are all workflow uh, forms. Essentially, these things have a assignment and a uh, approval rejection process. Also, revisions um, can be created from them. And this is where you manage who can do what on each of those forms. So you can view, create, assign, or approve, right? Uh, think of approve, by the way, as the ability to approve or reject, okay? So it's not just one way, but th this is the idea. So um, that is how you would handle permissions. You can dictate on an individual person level what they can do on a particular contract. Uh, obviously, you can add attachments if you needed to. So um, we don't, we don't, you know, if you want to actually add the actual contract we, we grant that ability. Okay, so let's go take a look at a contract that I've already built. Uh, this one's a $10 million contract uh, to work on Interstate 5. Uh, this is currently in draft. It has not been published, meaning that I've created the contract, but um, this contract, I don't want anybody to import a schedule of values against it or create change orders, etc. And as long as it stays in the state, nobody can generate uh, you know numbers or values against this particular contract it will stay here uh, I made up some some dummy values you know start date end date retainage etc uh, and so yeah this is this is an example of uh, one contract that is filled out obviously I would want more participants on this uh, uh, permission set now it is possible to have one person on here our cost application does allow for users to be able to um, uh, process workflow items even by yourself. You don't need to assign things to them. We'll cover that later, but I'm just saying that this is acceptable. Um, if I hit this drop down arrow, there is a deactivate option. This essentially puts the contract out of use and only, again, people with the permission, the ability to, to um, get into the, uh, what is it? Administ no, no, not that one. That's just the participants. There is a different section where we could, oh, maybe it's this one. It could be publish. But the idea is then that you can deactivate a contract. And you can re you can bring it back to life. It's not the end of the world. We don't shoot the system down or shoot your, your entire, your, if you deactivate it, you can't, you can't bring it back. That's not, you know, a, a huge thing. You just can go into it, uh, return it to draft, or I can publish it. Okay. And again, publishing enables the rest of, of these uh, abilities up here at the top. So we will do that if I hit publish. Actually, I might change something here in between uh, when I'm making these videos. But uh, for example, the discipline set, I think I'm going to choose not applicable. Just, uh, well, I don't know. Maybe it's better to have the data. OK, so this is how we handle our contracts and, and, and things like that. You'll note there also is an edit button up here. Uh, while it's in draft state, I can go back in and make changes to this. Uh, and there's also an audit trail. Well, can't do it right now. Let me see if I publish it. Can I get to my audit trail? Well, not yet. It's a feature coming soon. So not the end of the world. We're, we're, we, we recognize that an audit trail is necessary here because people can make changes to the contract. And we want to capture all of those changes somewhere. So, OK, so that is a brief overview of contracts. Again, you can create multiple contracts in the system. Uh, so it's not like you're limited to only creating one. And then all of the potential change orders, change orders, payment applications, etc., would be uh, tied to a particular contract. And if you are dealing with a subcontractor, such as an electrical subcontractor, and you create a separate subcontract in the system, they won't have access to other things unless you give them access via that permission table. Uh, so as to say, your electrician can't see your contract with your concrete guy or you know your steel erection guy or whatever the case may be. you want to keep things um, not visible to them this is how you do it you, you break out multiple contracts 